Uh, I have a housekeeping update, so I know why there's so much noise, and I know why it's kind of hot in here. Uh, so there's a problem with the AC system in this building, and they're trying to fix it. Uh, so hopefully it'll be more comfortable. Um, but for now, we have to put up with the noise. And I will try not to make you sleep nice and warm. Uh, maybe if you're mechanical engineers, but too bad. Um, another uh, housekeeping thing. So our first exam is coming up uh, on the 18th. Um, so that's not too far away. Your your next homework is due on Monday. Uh, I probably am not going to be able to get the, that homework back to you graded before the exam. So if you want a copy of homework 3 to study, uh, then make a copy of that homework before you turn it in on Monday. And on, on Monday, I'll talk more about uh, what's going to be on the exam. For now, let's continue talking about uh, op amps. So we went over the ideal op amp, and we went over the characteristics. So one of them is that the input resistance uh, into any of these input terminals is infinite. Any of the two input terminals. The resistance looking in to the output terminal is zero. Um, there is infinite common mode rejection. Which is just a fancy way of saying that if the voltage at the two inputs are equal to one another, then the output voltage is going to be equal to zero. Then we also said that the bandwidth of this amplifier is infinite, so it will equally amplify a signal of any frequency. And finally, the open loop gain of this amplifier is also infinite. Okay, so if I put any voltage at the input of this amplifier, uh, according to just this last definition, I'm supposed to get an infinite voltage at the output. But we already talked about that last time as well. If you look at the transfer uh, characteristic of output voltage versus input voltage, I don't get infinite voltages at the output. The infinite gain means that the slope of my transfer characteristic is infinite, so it's a vertical line. But my outputs are going to be limited to the positive and negative supply voltages that I supply to the amplifier.
Okay, but, um, and we also mentioned that we're never going to operate the amplifier in this open loop kind of configuration. Oops. So this should be a circuit, an, an, an op-amp circuit uh, that you've seen before, where we always have uh, some kind of feedback loop between the output of the amplifier uh, going back into the input. Okay, so um, there's there's two um, things to recognize about this circuit. So when we learned this inverting op amp circuit before, we just learned what the uh, equation is for the output voltage. We didn't really go too much into how this whole thing is working. So one point of this circuit that we can relate to now that we know about amplifiers is that the resistance looking in to uh, this output terminal of the op amp is zero. That was a property of our ideal op, op, op amp. So what that means is that for this op amp, I don't really care what my uh, output resistance is too much because it shouldn't really affect the output voltage. Uh, that's not entirely true because if I try to um, source too much current from this op amp, I'm going to run into some limits. But uh, to a, a, a reasonable amount, the output voltage is going to be uh, independent upon the load resistance. Not not for any uh, load resistance though. And the other important point is that now I have this uh, path between the output of my op amp at this point in the in the circuit going back towards the input. So this is providing a negative feedback loop. And what this loop does is it lowers the gain of my op amp. It's not infinite anymore, but it's making this circuit much more stable. Okay, so let's, to refresh ourselves, let's look at the gain uh, of the inverting op amp. So in order to derive this, I'm going to replace the inside of the op amp by um, an equivalent circuit model. And that is going to be uh, just open circuits at the inverting and non-inverting inputs because the input resistance is infinite. And a dependent source with the open loop gain factor A and the value of this source is going to be A times the difference uh, between V2 and V1, where this is V2, and that's V1. Okay, so we'll assume that because we have our ideal op amp, that our gain factor A is infinite. So if I want to write an equation for my output voltage, my output voltage is the voltage from this point in the circuit to ground, so it's going to be the same as the voltage across that dependent source. Okay, so my output voltage will be equal to A times V2 minus V1. That's the voltage across that dependent source. Then if you move uh, A over to the left-hand side of the equation, you'll get um, output voltage divided by A equals V2 minus V1. Um, but A is infinite, so this left-hand side is going to go to zero. And that means that V2 is going to be equal to V1. Okay, and this property of the op-amp, uh, if you recall, is called a virtual short. So it's like terminals 1 and 2 are shorted together because they have the same voltage on them, but it's a virtual short. There's there's no physical connection between those two terminals. So it's not a real short circuit. It's just that 
whatever voltage you have on V2 will also be the voltage that you have on V1. And in this case, V2 happens to be grounded. So that means V1 will also be at the ground potential. So V1 has a virtual ground. Okay, so once we recognize that fact, that V1 is at the ground potential, uh, now it's easy to solve for the gain in this circuit. Everyone okay so far? Okay, so if we know that uh, V1 is at ground potential, uh, then we can solve the circuit by solving uh, first for I1. So it might be hard to see on this slide. Okay, so that's the current I1. So if I want to use Ohm's law to write an equation for I1, what is that going to be? Uh, just VI divided by R1 because V1 is at, at a ground potential. So um, virtually it looks like Oh, I shouldn't be drawing here. Let me draw up here. Here's VI. Here's my resistor R1. And this point in the circuit is V1. But that's equal to zero volts. So it's not really connected to ground, but it's virtually grounded. And I'm trying to find I1. Okay, so I1 is just VI divided by R1. Okay, now, so I have one equation, but, and I have VI in my equation, but I don't have um, uh, V0 in the equation. So, next thing I need to do is somehow try to make V0 uh, relate to this. And I can do that by using this other current, I2. Okay, so what's the relationship between uh, I1 and I2? Okay, so I1 has to be equal to I2. Why is that? Because of KCL, that's right, because of KCL at, at this point. Okay, so I1 enters this node, I2 leaves that node, and there's no current going into an input terminal of the op amp because that input resistance is, in, is uh, infinite. Okay, so no current can enter this part. So that means by KCL, I1, the current entering the node, has to be equal to I2, which is the only current leaving the node. Okay, so... Uh, using this relationship, I'm going to, uh, I can say that I2 is also equal to VI over R1, but I can also write I2 in terms of the output voltage. Okay, so what is I2 in terms of uh, the output voltage? It's V naught over R2. Is that positive or negative? This is negative because V naught in this circuit isn't that polarity. Okay, so I'm going to substitute, uh, let's call this, so I'm going to substitute equation 3 into equation 2 and use that to go into equation 1 which means that negative V0 over R2 equals VI 
over R1. But uh, remember, I'm trying to find gain. So let me first just rearrange terms so that I'm solving for the output voltage. Okay, so this is the output voltage of my inverting op amp. And the gain is just the output voltage divided by the input voltage. So that's negative R2 over R1. Sorry, what? <coughs> So, so gain, I don't have, to, if I want to take magnitude of gain, yes, it's R2 over R1, but gain can have positive or negative. So it's the, if it's a negative gain, again, what does that mean? In, yeah, what, so what, what does inverting mean? Phase shift of of 180 degrees, so my my output is is directly out of phase with my input, but it's still amplified. It's still large. It still has a bigger amplitude. If you have negative dB, then then that's not gain. Then that's attenuation. But we're not in units of dB here. Okay, so actually we just talked about this. So the output signal will be uh, the input signal with 180 degree phase shift and if I were to plot the transfer characteristic for this amplifier, it will look something like this. And the slope, oops, ignore that. What's the slope of this part of the transfer characteristic? R2 over R1. But the line goes this way, so it's a negative slope. <clears throat> okay. So, but all of this you should already know um, from 2.11. What we don't know from 2.11 is, okay, what if our amplifier is not ideal. And now we're going to say, okay, we're, we're going to take away one of the ideal properties of the op amp. And we're going to make that open loop gain some finite value now. It's not infinity anymore. Okay, so now we can figure out what the gain of the op amp will be. The analysis is just uh, a little bit more complicated. We can start off with the, the same uh, first step that we had when we were assuming that the gain was infinite. So the output voltage is equal to that open loop gain multiplied by the difference in voltage between the two terminals. And then I'm still going to move over, move that gain term open loop gain term to the left hand side of the equation. But now since since A is finite, this is not equal to zero. And so V2 is not equal to V1 anymore. I can't say that because I have a finite gain. What can I say? 
What do I know about V2? Uh, this is V1, this is V2. So I know that that V2 is equal to 0 volts. Okay, so if I plug uh, V2 equals 0 back into my equation, and, it, and I solve for V1, then V1 is going to be negative V0 over A. Okay, so I still know values for V2 and V1. They're just not equal to each other anymore. So we're going to use this information now and do kind of the same steps that we did before. So once again, we're going to solve for I1. We, I'm still going to assume that uh, the input resistance of the op amp is infinite. Okay, so I2, this is I2. I2 is still going to be equal to I1 because I'm going to assume that no current goes into the op amp. And so we can do the same analysis, but now we just have to say that uh, we have to recognize that V2 and V1 are not the same voltage. Okay, so let's start that on the next slide. So V1 at this point in the circuit is negative V0 over A. And V2, which is here, is ground, so we know that's zero. And this is I1. Okay, so what's my new equation for I1? VI it's sort of like writing a a node voltage equation term for this this branch here. Yeah, okay, so VI we need, so the voltage here minus the voltage at the other side of the resistor, but that's negative. divided by the resistance. So VI plus V0 over A over R1. Okay, so that's our equation for I1. Just like how we got an equation for I1 before. By KCL um, at this node at the, at the node with V1, we know that I2 is equal to I1, just like we, we did before. And so uh, what we did before was we wrote uh, an equation for I2. Um, but this time, let's just write an equation for, for V0 instead. Almost the same thing. How are we going to do that? Um, we can just do a KCL, sorry, KVL around this loop. Okay, so V0 is equal to uh, the voltage drop across resistor R2. So negative I2 times R2. Um, and you have to add this voltage drop too, which is negative V0 over A. I'm doing a KVO here. 
Okay, but we said uh, I2 is equal to I1. So I'm going to substitute the value or the equation for I1 for I2. Okay, so that's negative. Oops. VI plus V0 over A over R1 times R2 and minus V0 over A. Okay, so now I have an equation that includes A because it's finite. It includes V0 and it includes VI. So I can do some algebra to this thing and I can get an equation for my gain which is V0 over VI and it's going to turn out to be negative R2 over R1 divided by 1 plus a second term and the second term is 1 over R2 over R1 divided by A. So the algebra was a little messy. But forget all that. Let's just look at uh, what this equation means. Okay, so what happens if if we go back to our ideal case and if A becomes infinite again? Yeah, if this happens, then I get back my original equation. Because if A becomes infinite, the second term in the denominator just goes to zero. And so my gain goes back to being negative R2 over R1. Now, if I don't have, uh, if I have a finite gain, then I need to use this equation. But even though the gain is not infinite, it's usually pretty high. So the second term in the equation is going to be uh, relatively small, uh, less less than one. So it's not you're not going to be affecting the the gain of this uh, non-inverting op amp. Sorry, this inverting op amp too much compared to the ideal case if I have a, uh, a real op amp. But if we look at this uh, formula here where we have finite gain, it also gives us an insight into why we are adding this feedback network to begin with. Because now my gain is approximately negative R2 over R1, right? So it's, it can be kind of high, but it's not, it's definitely not infinity. So why am I going through all of this trouble to end up with an amplifier that has a lower gain? Okay, so let's look at um, how this, this feedback, or this resistor R2, uh, is affecting how stable my gain is. Okay, so we're going to start off with that equation from the previous slide that includes the uh, finite gain term. And let's say that we have a ratio of R2 to R1 uh, of 100. Okay, so that means um, if I have my ideal case, what's my gain? It's negative R2 over R1, so it would be negative 100. Okay, now let's say that I, I'm not using an ideal op amp anymore. I pick up an op amp uh, in the lab, and maybe this one was manufactured uh, most recently on a very good uh, 
fabrication line. So I have a pretty high open loop gain. Okay, uh, 10 million. Not infinite, but pretty high. If I plug that number into here, and I plug in the value, the same values of my resistors, then in this case, my gain of my op amp circuit is going to be negative 99.999. So pretty close to the ideal case. Then let's say I went home uh, and I came back to lab next week and I wanted to build a non, uh, an, an inverting op amp circuit again. But this time I picked maybe an old op amp that's been, in, been around for a few years. Um, and so it wasn't made on the, the best and newest uh, fabrication line. In that case, maybe my gain is a factor of 100 lower, my open loop gain. Okay, if you plug that number into our, our gain equation, keeping R2 over R1 is equal to 100. Uh, any guesses on what this is going to be? Just intuition. I'm changing my open loop gain by a factor of 100. That's pretty big. So this is what you'll get as your gain. So you have a, even though you have a big difference in open loop gain, it has a very minimal effect on the gain of this circuit because of the fact that you have this feedback network in here. It helps to stabilize the gain of the op amp. So this is important. Like if you, you know, make a circuit using that has multiple op amps, they're all going to have slightly different gain values. It's important if you want your circuit to be stable over temperature because temperature is going to affect uh, this, this gain value of your op amp. Even if it's the exact same op amp, if you operate it at different temperatures, that's going to affect this open loop gain. So we're trading off an infinite gain to a much lower gain, but one that is much more stable and more reliable. Okay, so the conclusion is that the feedback reduces the gain but it makes it much more stable. And that's why you Never use op amps in the open loop configuration because you never know exactly what the gain is going to be. Any questions with this? Okay, let's analyze some other aspects of this uh, inverting op amp configuration. So it stabilizes the gain, which is good, but there is um, a drawback to the inverting configuration as well. So let's look at the, the input resistance of the inverting op amp. So I'm looking at, if I'm connecting up some source, I'm looking at this resistance. The resistance that I see uh, looking into my inverting op amp circuit. What is that resistance? Okay, well, if you don't 
know it, then how do you, how do we figure it out? What's the equation to figure it out? Mm, I think uh, you're you're maybe looking at it from a just a circuit layout kind of standpoint. So uh, intuitively, yeah, it looks like it, it should be some combination of R1 and R2. But let's look at it a little bit more analytically. Um, so what is, what is resistance? So, some voltage divided by some current. Now I'm looking into the input of this. So, and remember that this point in the circuit, we're going back to the ideal op amp. So this point in the circuit is a virtual ground. So if I just want to look at that input resistance, I can say it's this input voltage divided by, uh, let's call, let's, let's make an input current. Uh, let me just make it I1, because I've been calling this I1 the whole time. Okay, and... Because I1 is, is that same current that we've been looking at so far, and because this point in the circuit is a virtual ground, I1 is VI over R1. That's what we wrote down before. So these cancel. So my input resistance is just equal to the value of R1. Okay, now let's say that uh, we're amplifying a voltage. So what did we want the input resistance of a voltage amplifier to be? What's the ideal input resistance of a voltage amplifier? Either zero or infinity. Uh, maybe let's look at our voltage amplifier model. So I want my input voltage to be as large as possible, no matter what I have connected up to the left of that. What if, what if RI is zero? What's my input voltage? Let's just look at the input side of this. So now I'll connect up the source. Okay, what if Ri is zero? What is Vi? Who says Vs? Who says zero? Not enough people are saying zero. Mm -hmm. It's a short circuit, right? No voltage across a short circuit. So my ideal input resistance is not zero. It's probably the other extreme. So what if Ri is infinite? What is the, what is Vi in terms of Vs? V 
Yes. So that's what I want. I want my input voltage to be equal to my source voltage no matter what the value of that source resistance is. Okay, so the ideal input resistance Sorry, I'm writing very badly. The ideal input resistance is infinite. But I just said that for my inverting op amp, my input resistance is equal to R1. So it's not infinite. So how would I make my input resistance approach ideal? I have to make R1 as big as possible, right? But if I look at the gain equation, R1 is on the bottom. So if I want a, a, a high input resistance from my inverting op amp, that means one of two things. Either my gain is going to be very low because I, I want to make my denominator as big as possible, or the value that I need for R2 has to be even larger than R1. Theoretically, that's fine. But in real life, you're going to run into some limits on the largest resistor value that you can find. Uh, especially when you're designing integrated circuits. So for integrated circuits, the way, the way that you make a resistor is you don't grab one of those little cylindrical things with the, with the two leads coming off it. That takes up way too much space on an integrated circuit. What a resistor looks like on an integrated circuit is you have a very thin, uh, flat piece of, of metal on your board. And you'll just make the length of it proportional to whatever resistance you want across it. So the more resistance you want, the longer that, that strip of metal has to be. The longer that strip of metal has to be, the more room it's taking up on your board. And the more room it takes up on your board, that means um, there's that many less boards that you can make at once. So that drives up the cost of your device. And we're used to having very cheap electronics, right? If you had to pay uh, you know, a penny per transistor um, in your CPU, then that would be like $10 million for the CPU. So we're at, where we drive down the cost of electronics by packing them as, as densely as we can onto whatever materials that we have. So to make very large resistances, you're just wasting material, only for a resistor. So there's some practical limits here. So uh, let me kind of sum it up. So to make the input resistance large, that means the value of R1 has to be large. Um, but there's practical limits. Oops. on how big a resistor you can actually use. And that's somewhere about 10 mega ohms or so. You don't want to use resistors that are bigger than that. And because of that, that means that you're, you're either trading off gain or input resistance to this circuit. Now, if you don't need a high gain, and you don't need a very high input resistance, it's fine, you don't care. But if you need both, then that is a drawback of this configuration. Okay, let's look at an example of that. So let's say I have an ideal op amp. Um, can I... Uh, and I have an inverting configuration. So I want to achieve a gain of negative 100 and an input resistance of omega ohm. And I'm going to limit myself to using resistors uh, that are at most 1 mega ohm. Okay, so if I do that, 
Um, the easiest thing to do at first is just to say, okay, that means this R1 is equal to 1 mega ohm because my input resistance is equal to R1 and I wanted that to be a mega ohm. Okay, so if I do that, then I need to calculate the value of R2 that I need. The gain of my op, op amp is R2 over R1, and I want that to be negative 100. Now if R1 is 1 mega ohm, that means that R2 needs to be 100 mega ohms, but I wanted to use resistors with a reasonable value, so at, at most a mega ohm. So I can't meet this specification using this circuit. There are ways to make this a little bit better though. Uh, it'll probably take me a while to complete the analysis, so we can stop here.